Welcome to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute, a free market think tank in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. In each episode, I speak with an individual who made the choice to participate in governing our nation. Some of my guests have worked for the government. Others have toiled in various private sector organizations, including think tanks, philanthropies, and political groups. All of them share the same goal, however, which is to improve our country through public service. Today's guest is Carlos Mark Vera, executive director and co-founder of Pay Our Interns. It is an organization that seeks to ensure that everyone has equitable access to professional career paths through the implementation of paid internships nationwide. Carlos co-created Pay Our Interns in 2016, and already the group has had great success. 2019, it convinced Congress to pony up $31 million to pay interns who work for Capitol Hill. Carlos previously interned in Congress and the White House. He worked for the National Association of Secondary Schools Principals, and he was a U.S. Army Reservist for eight years. You can learn more about Carlos by visiting payourinterns.org. Carlos, welcome to the Why Public Service podcast. Thank you for having me. As our listeners have heard, you are an entrepreneur in the not-for-profit space. What led you to co-found Pay Our Interns? What was the path that led you to this unique place? For me, it really came down to personal experience. My, I, you know, I've done three unpaid internships. The first one being uh, in the House of Representatives back in 2012 when I was in college. And because I couldn't afford to you know, intern for free, what I had to do was work about 25 hours a week intern 30 hours a week and then take six courses as an 18 year old. So, you know, as opposed to really trying to immerse myself in the internship, it was like kind of a fight to stay awake. And, you know, I guess walking down the hallways of Congress one day and realizing that no one else looked like me except the custodian. And then I did two other unpaid internships, but you know, you just kind of think uh, you're paying your dues, right? It wasn't until I spoke to my mentee and he had mentioned that he had skipped out on buying groceries to pay for dry cleaning costs for the same unpaid hill internship. And at that point, I kind of knew that this needed to stop. So I quit my job, much to the displeasure of my family, and I started pay our interns. As a follow-up question, let me ask, how does one just start an organization? So few of us have done it. To be honest, (laughs) I... How do I say this? Most entrepreneurs, what you do is you actually go to funders and you do that like seed round. You present your concept, your idea, you get the money, then you do the work. I did it the opposite way. I just kind of started it (laughs) as a campaign. And, you know, while obviously we do work in Congress, the original concept was to ensure that interns across sectors get paid. We decided to start in Congress because myself and the other co-founder, Guillermo, both had interned there. And we saw the implications of uh, reflective democracy, right? Like, ultimately, we want to have a governing body that reflects the various communities of the country. But yeah, so like I said, like we kind of started it through Facebook. It wasn't until like two, three months in that, you know, you had to do the paperwork, you know, apply through the IRS for 501c3 status and so on and so forth. So it began as a campaign and the idea just seems so compelling that you decided to make it official and make it legal. And after that came funding? We actually did not really get any funding from a foundation until 2018, like October. So it was actually two years in that we actually received funding. I think part of it, for no conversation, but like for entrepreneurs of color that are young, it's much more difficult. So it was mostly like through grassroots donations. And then I was a full-time server while my counterpart was working at FEMA um, during Hurricane Maria. Wow. Yeah, it must have been a demanding couple of years. But now, Pay Our Interns is the real deal. It's had great success. It's gotten great media. And you're the executive director. What are your responsibilities as executive director? A little bit of everything. It consists of fundraising, ensuring you're staying in touch with your contacts in Congress, relationship with the board doing media interviews, helping write like policy memos, working on a communication strategy, and then kind of bringing it all together into like a long-term strategic plan. So there, those are a couple of my duties. Yeah, and that bleeds over into my next question, which is 
for our listeners who are thinking about, do they one day get into this space? What does your average day look like? Is it the same thing day after day or is every day different? I would say every day is different. I feel like it's extremely exciting. Some weeks are busier than others. And then there are some weeks kind of like when we dropped the, our report, Color of Congress, the week beforehand, we spent some time editing the report the next day, writing an op-ed for Team Vogue. And then the next day, like helping write a grant. And then the day after, like having a call with some elected officials. So it varies. I, I would say that, you know, the entrepreneurial life is not always as structured and it is sometimes longer than some like nine to five jobs. You know, like I don't know what nine to five is. Well, that must be exhausting. So you previously have worked on the Hill and then you started a not-for-profit organization that works with Capitol Hill. Yes. You've seen governing close up. I have. What sort of lessons have you drawn from your experience thus far? I had one guest who emphasized that elections really, really matter in his experience. And another guest has said, it's the relationships you develop. What about you? For me, it really comes down to seeing how Congress relies on like outside organizations the same way that we rely on them. You know, like it's a relationship. It's sometimes messy, complicated, but it's one that's needed. You know, not one single entity is doing it all. It very much is an ecosystem and everyone kind of does its part. For me, what I was shocked about was how a lot of congressional offices lack certain technical skills that you think they would have, but they don't. And that probably obviously has to, you know, do with defunding of the legislative branch over the last two, three decades. But that's one of the things that I was kind of impressed in, like having 80 offices reach out to your organization within two months and being like, how do you pay an intern? Where do you find them? How much? You know, all these questions that you think that they would have from a, like a logistical standpoint, but they don't. Well, it's a good thing you're there to help them out with these questions. Now, as a follow-up, I want to ask, you start a brand new organization. You're trying to create change on Capitol Hill. As we all know, Congress has so many things to pay attention to. How did you get them to listen to you? We initially sent 40 emails to senators. Only like two, three responded, including Senator Inghoff and Senator Rubio. None of the Democrats responded to our emails. And we soon realized that we faced a big barrier, and it was the fact that there was no publicly available data on which offices paid and which ones did not. And as you know, you're only going to go so far with stories, right? Like you need the numbers. So we decided to do a survey across both uh, chambers, you know, either calling, going to the office, looking online, and trying to figure out who paid, who didn't. We did that for about three months. While in that process, we soon realized that even though Congress is extremely polarized and sometimes, you know, they can't even agree on like naming a park. One thing that we noticed, we're like, wait, if Senator Inhofe pays his interns and he cares about this, and so does Senator Bernie Sanders, from a political standpoint, they have very few in common, like little things in common, but they pay their interns. So we started noticing that this was one of the few issues that had cross-party appeal. And then when we finished up the report, we kind of leveraged that against offices being like, hey, we're going to report this in two months. You either have the option to be listed in category A or category B. What, you know, what do you want? And that was really um, helpful. Well, that sounds like another little lesson in governance. It's the value of having the data. Yes. And how do you leverage it? And how do you kind of push offices in a certain direction? The data, I imagine, were rather embarrassing to many Hill offices and to other Hill offices, they were validating. Yeah. So one of the outcomes of the report was it showed that Republicans were offering more paid internships to Democrats in both chambers. And it kind of dispelled this you know, viewpoint that people were like, oh, you would think it's, it would be Democrats. It's like, nope. So that was one of the nuggets. And then one last point about that was we released a report June 30th and a lot of offices were like, oh, we're going to try to look for some of the money. And then one of them, you know, we notified them. We're like, we're releasing it tomorrow. And it's a, a Democratic senator. And their office miraculously found money to pay interns within two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess one thing also to note is the power of media and how journalism can help hold powerful institutions accountable. Absolutely. You've already intimated that it's not easy being an entrepreneur. The hours are long and the schedule is unpredictable. If you could identify one thing as the toughest part of your current job, what would it be? 
Ooh. I'm going to be those annoying uh, guests that kind of split it in half. They're kind of similar, but not. One I would say is there really is no infrastructure around, you know, paid internships in this work. Like it impacts a lot of people, but they're not that many organizations or, you know, think things like we rely on data. There is really no think tanks that focus on this. So that means that we have to be doing that work. But it's a cost benefit analysis, right? The more time we focus on collecting data, the less time we can do advocacy efforts or other programs, right? And then within that same vein, like fundraising is not always easy. Like it's gotten easier finally after like four years. But may, very few orgs want to invest in an um, organization that's like holding an institution accountable. They don't want to piss off Congress, so they don't write a check. <laughs> <laughs> this brings me to my closing question. It's not easy. It's an uphill battle trying to get people to do what you think is the right thing. It's not easy to raise money. It's not easy to start an organization all on your own or even with just a partner. Hmm. So why public service? You could have chosen another career path. Yes, I've been provided the option to work in the corporate sector and make $150,000. So, <laughs> which is, you know, always like alluring. For me, it, it really came down to, I would say that Hill internship. It was the first taste into the public sector and seeing the levers of government and its ability to either help or hurt your community. You know, a lot of folks say, oh, I'm not interested in politics and government, but politics is the one that decides, does a trash get taken out or not, right? Do the roads get paved or not? And in particular, Congress, you're talking about $2 trillion that gets dispersed each year. So for me, that's kind of been the lure, and that's why I've continued just in a different position, but still within that ecosystem. And I love it. A lot of people out there who are seeking internships or recently got them are very thankful that you did choose the course you did. So Carlos, thank you so much for all you do. And thank you for being on the podcast. Of course. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Thank you for listening to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute. Please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. Even better, rate and review us on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. Tell us what you thought about it and who we should interview next by finding us on Twitter at RSI. If you want to know more about R Street, sign up for our newsletters at www.rstreet.org. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. Thank you to producer William Gray and editor Parker Tant from parkerpodcasting.com. <laughs>